So most leaders make the mistake, especially newer leaders, like I've got to have all the answers. I've got to have it figured out. And no, leadership is something you do with people not two people. And that's the same thing with change. Don't work so hard. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to The Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a very good one. Our guest is an experienced leader, consultant, and executive coach who is passionate about helping teams and organizations successfully navigate and evolve through change. Her new book, Forward, Leading Your Team Through Change, is coming out February 2023. Dr. Elizabeth Moran, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. So excited to connect with you and your audience. Uh, It's wonderful to have you here. And absolutely, you've got a new book coming out, Leading Your Team Through Change. And we were just chatting before we started the recording. I mean, what isn't changing? So I'm so (laughs) excited to have this conversation help our listener gain some inside edge on, on how to do that. But before we get into all of that, please, Elizabeth, tell us about your career journey leading up to this point. So probably like many people, it's been a bit of a meandering path. So when I started my career, I was like, oh, well, I like people, so let's get into HR. So that was about the amount of thought that went into it. So I started in human resources, and then at a certain point became disillusioned, because when I was in human resources, it still was an unevolved, it's very different than it is now. And so if they didn't know what to do with an executive, they put them in charge of human resources. So at a certain point, I became disillusioned. And then I left the corporate world to get a doctorate in clinical psychology. And towards the end of that, whilst I enjoyed private practice, I didn't feel done with the corporate world, primarily because I felt like organizations kind of did stupid things to demotivate people which really is humans in general. So I wanted to get back into the corporate world, but with a focus specifically in the leadership development area. So I did that, had a pretty good run, and then I got to Lehman Brothers, <laughs> so, mm. which is, was an interesting experience. I was there from 2006 to 2008. Wow. And yep, and it was in the thick of it. So there was tremendous learning, which we can always talk about at a, at a future, future time. But really, it was really honing again, do I want to do this? And so I ended up moving to Vermont and, you know, it was really hard to get another job. But I did land again, did some consulting work still in this field and then uh, was most recently uh, at ADP, and I was heading up all of their leader team and organizational development business globally. And then a couple of years ago, really in 2020, I knew that I had the book that I wanted to write, and I've always wanted to have my own business. So I negotiated my way out and have been working on the book and building the business since then. And so here we are. Wow. Very cool. And and definitely uh, an interesting career stop being at Lehman with uh, a lot of change likely happening in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm, Exactly. I I think it's one of those things that a lot of people remember. As time goes on, they may not, but especially I noticed there's more conversation coming up about it now, given the current state of the economy. But it was something that I, I certainly learned a lot from. And some of that experience also, all of these experiences have informed, you know, with the work that goes into the book here. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's very cool. Now I'm curious when it, when it comes to starting your own business, 
I mean, our listeners are, are very attuned to starting their own business, very similar trajectory, right? It's like they're doing something and then uh, decide that having their own business is a great idea. And then they, they get they get into it and, and going. Lots of ups, lots of downs. What's the experience mm-hmm. been like for you? I think with all of what I've learned, you know, again, the name of the company, Elizabeth Moran Transformation, like it's all there in terms of what it's all about. So I do think understanding the business is me. It's just an, it's just one form of me. So always trying to look at it as a work in progress and all the experiences I've had up until this point, when times get rough, as you know, all of your many of your listeners will experience in one way or another, you know, what is it that gets us through? Mm. What's our purpose? You know, do we have a North Star? And I think a lot of this last couple of years for me has been about what am I going to choose to give my energy to? I can get lost sometimes in the fear and the uncertainty. Um, but it, it, when it all comes down to it, a- am I doing the best I can do? And and if the answer is yes, then a lot of it has been giving myself permission to enjoy the downtime as opposed to equating not being busy with I'm going to starve. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so I think it, it's been a lot of a, a growth, trying to be in a growth mindset. That's one. Two is the other experience that actually has been wonderful is I've really spent time trying to continue to visualize why am I doing what I'm doing? What is it? What's the purpose? What do I want to put out there? And who are the types of partners that I'd like to work with? So I have been very um purposeful, but also very blessed to have partners along the way who have guided me, who, who've who been really great partners to help me build the business. And that has been a great experience, really. What is it? Are, what are my strengths? And if they're not my strengths, how do I allow and enable a great partnership with somebody else so they can bring their strengths to help me? So a lot of it is letting go of control which is uh, always fascinating. And then I, I do believe just being able to go with the flow. So what it was I thought it was going to be at the very beginning is changing and allowing that to shift and change as I learn more and not looking at that as, oh, you know, bringing the judgment in, oh, I didn't do great or I must not have thought about this right. No, it's what's happening. It's fine. Um, and allowing that to be. So it's been a it's been an amazing experience. Sometimes, for sure, I'm white knuckling it along the way. Mm. But I ground in. You know, I've white knuckled it in the past, and you know what? Um, things have turned out okay. And it's remembering that. It's that time of year again. And after a great showing in 2021, the successful Bookkeeper Summit returns even bigger and better. It's a two-day virtual conference that features incredible speakers from the bookkeeping, accounting, and business world, such as value pricing expert Ron Baker and Joe Woodard of the Woodard Group. And that's just to name a few. The theme of this year's event is Make It Grow. And there's no doubt the content you'll consume will help you achieve more success than you ever thought possible. It all begins on November 9th, 2022. To secure your free spot, visit thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com forward slash summit. And again, that's thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com forward slash summit. Register today and I'll see you at the summit. And now let's get back to our interview. It's great. It's great. Always, there's always a great message in someone else's perspective of of their journey and, and having worked with so many small business owners in, in this industry uh, and, and spoken to so many of our, our listeners that I constantly hear, you know, th- that people maybe disconnect from their why, why are they doing it? Uh, mm-hmm. Because it, it drives so powerful driving. If it just comes down to like doing the work, 
it can easily become demotivating. Uh, so mm -hmm. connecting back, and, and I like how you said that is like you. It sounds like you actually come back to that quite often. What? Why are you doing what you're doing? And then who can you partner with? I mean, if I think of the real successful people in our industry, they're really connected to their why. And they're really connected with other partners. They haven't done this on their own. They've done it with many other people that have been involved, partners, and uh, and that helps accelerate their success. Oh, for sure, for sure. And it, it, I, I, I always try to remember, and it's exactly as you're saying. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I want to bring something unique forward. But there is a humbling experience with this, which is let me be able to ask for help and then receive it <laughs> because those aren't the same thing. Um, and that's also been, I've been much more comfortable as, as and it's funny in my work with others, finding this too, so many people much more comfortable with giving than receiving. Mm. Uh, receiving seems much more vulnerable a place to be in. So true. So true. Now, when it comes to the work that you do, if we think about mistakes that leaders would be making with their teams, well, what would those big ones be? I mean, this is, this is, you've spent probably a lot of time thinking about this as you've been writing your book and getting it ready. <laughs> what are some of those mistakes? Well, listen, these are mistakes even that I made and continue to make at certain times. So I think so much of when I talk about great change leadership is great leadership. And as you, you and I were talking, you have a lot of experience with that as well. So great change leadership starts with the person. And one of the biggest challenges I think for leaders oftentimes in a professional setting is just the, the total discomfort with emotions and uh, the messiness of humans, you know, going through change or otherwise. So when I thought broadly about what are the underlying core principles of the approach that I'm trying to put out there, there are three. One is remembering that you're already a change expert. The second is that resistance isn't a problem. That resistance is normal. And the third is that celebrating brings success. So the mistakes that leaders make usually are fall into one of those buckets. So one is, you know, in the interest of just trying to get the change done and moving fast, people want to skip over all the emotions and just tell people, here's what's changing, get on board, stop complaining and go forward. And that's probably the biggest mistake. And a lot of that has more to do with what the leader needs and wants versus what the team needs and wants. And if the leader can shift their mindset, which is the first, the first thing, when you lead through change, if you go into leading through change with people are going to react, people are not going to like it. That's not a problem. You know, resistance isn't a permanent state, but in and of itself, they're just being normal, good humans. And if that is your mindset, then it becomes, I don't have to stand opposite this reaction. I don't have to control it. It's somebody's reaction is not a barometer of my change leadership abilities. It's just what happens. So if I can use... Uh, my curiosity in that moment and simply pause and say, yeah, you know what, whether it's I have concerns about this change myself or tell me a little bit about what's upsetting you about this change or what do you have a problem with? Use that curiosity. And this is where I think those in your audience, this is a great strength of people who are in this field is you are financial detectives, really, in many ways. So if you look at resistance or any type of emotional reaction as data, so it's as valuable as any number on a spreadsheet, it just comes in a different package. So if the leader can look at that as, oh, okay, huh, this isn't this, I'm, I'm thinking this person, it's pretty clear, so maybe sometimes it's more subtle, isn't happy about this, let me just start to understand why. And if you can do that, that 
instantly could take some nervousness or pressure off of the leader to to then it's not a problem it's normal let me become curious and trusting that in this case then resistance simply becomes concerns that haven't yet been addressed so if i can understand it uncover it not just skip over it then we're much more likely to to address any obstacles there's probably some wisdom there so if i can understand address some obstacles there if i can do it now better than have something simmer and come out on you know further up that slows us down so i'd say that's probably the biggest one mm, i can relate to that i think over the years anytime that something new or some change has been made from my own perspective as a person that might be part of making those changes any kind of feedback that's not positive seems like a detour or a you know back step uh, or criticism or something that's about me right it's how i'm listening it's how i'm i'm taking that in because my I'm not thinking about them i'm thinking about what you know we made a change we made a change for a reason and we're on this road and so it's like this avoidance of dealing with with the emotions and a fear a fear like that's like maybe the you know the direction was does that mean it's wrong, this change? Does it mean it's not going to work out? You know, like all of that is all cut, speaking to my own limitations or self-limiting belief about myself and the role that I'm playing and the responsibility that I've taken on. And, and that's part of being the leader is that, you know, we have all these things to deal with as our, as our own human being. Exactly. And I think you said it very well. So I, I would love to ask you, can you remember a time when you resisted a change that you didn't initiate? So something that might've come down and I'm just curious, you don't have to necessarily get into what the change was, but what contributed to your resistance? Well, I'd say I would definitely say it's easy to think about where, like I've probably spent a lot of my career being in a position where I'm making the changes <laughs> because I don't <laughs> want someone else to make the changes. I mean, cause I worked in corporate for a, a good decade and, and, you know, came out of school and that's where I went. But I also ran my own small businesses before that while I was going to school and then going to the corporate world, which is, yeah, that I'm part of an, a bigger picture, a bigger ecosystem. Uh, everything has to sort of be run up the, the flagpole or whatever the case may be. And so mm -hmm. those, those things also come down. I'm not privy to everything that's up at the top. I'm, I'm not even privy to things that are going down below me. So that was the corporate experience. Whilst it was very valuable and learned a lot of things, I would say that was one of the things I disliked the most was not being able to have a say or be involved in those. So it's a, it's a, it can be very frustrating uh, but I'm also on the other side of it, I'm also quite uh, agile where I can pivot quite quickly. And that's my own mm -hmm. person. And I don't think many business owners would go very far if they didn't have the ability to pivot. Um, you, you mentioned it sort of in your, you know, your own obstacles. It's like what you think it's going to be changes quite quickly and you need to pivot. So it's hard to even embrace those those moments of like, hey, where do I not have that control? Where am I not making is someone changing something on myself? Because I'm in this mode of like, just, okay, that's changed. We're going to do something about it and pivot. So yeah. yeah, but I think my insight there was really, because we've been doing a lot of new things in our own organization, launching some new software, launching some some cool things. And it's it's like I'm very close to it, very invested in it emotionally, and so any kind of feedback uh, can be can be challenging. It's like, oh, like I almost just thinking about it, it seems almost fixed. Like if you said something about it, it's what well, it's broken. It's you know, it's like we got to fix it. It's just, but when I stop and think about the people that have made comments or said, you know, what about this or what about that, they're not saying it from that perspective. So I think for me, the big takeaway is just to take a deep breath and really embrace and look for it and listen to the feedback when change is being uh, introduced. Yes. Oh, Michael, there's 
such good nuggets in all of what you said. So I'm going to play back to you and you tell me if you, you get it. So first of all, I loved when you were very clear about fundamentally, you know, when is change a good idea? Well, when it's our idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so, exactly. So much, right? So, so much of organizational change in organizations happens and it, it comes down or comes across and you and potentially your team didn't initiate it. Nobody asked you and yet it impacts you. So if you think about it, that's, that makes sense. It's not an unreasonable you know, reason of why somebody would resist Another couple of things that I hear about why people resist is, look, it directly impacts us. It's in our area of expertise, and yet we weren't involved. To we don't really understand why it's changing. To you know what? I don't really trust that the people who are in charge of this change know what they are doing. To you know what? I just thought things were going really well. I like it the way it is. And none of those are bad. And so as we talk about it, there is some resistance, right? As leaders, how do we just, just because it's not our resistance or not our perspective, how do we do what you said is, okay, whilst I might take it as a criticism or um, slowing me down, how do I just take a pause and, and listen? That's really important. The other thing you mentioned was agility. So it sounds like you, part of who you are and what you enjoy, you you like things to be switched up at times. Is, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I would say I'm okay with it switching. I, I It's one of those things where if you ask me, I'd be like, well, no, I like things to be certain. And, you know, I like certainty. I'm a human being. But at the same time, yeah, I like variety, adventure you know, freedom. So there, there'd be a part of me that would, if something was going really well, I I might, I might expand on it and make it more challenging, which is, you know, for some people that's like, why are you doing that? Stop doing that. (laughs) Yes. It worked well in the past. How can we make this more interesting? You know? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes you just get bored is what I'm hearing. You like to switch it up sometimes. Yeah, I, mean, not I think it's, itself, yeah, I think. It, it's mm-hmm. kind of, um, I don't know that it, I don't know that it would stem from boredom, maybe the avoidance of boredom, but it certainly stems from wanting to like be, be creative and create and, and, mm. and also really trying to do the very best that we can. Like the, for yeah. example, is we, we've, we put on a summit for our industry last year. It weren't really well, the successful bookkeeper summit. We're doing another one this November. And, Mm. and so I was just actually thinking about it this morning and I put a lot of weight on my shoulders around it being like one upping, right? Like how are we going to make it even better? How it's like, there's no limit to how good it can be. And that is a lot of pressure I put on myself, which Mm -hmm. is not always enjoyable. And so it's like, I might sit back and go, why am I doing that? And so it's like, I have to ground my own, my own self. But I, if I think mm-hmm. about it, if I'm putting that pressure on myself, I'm sure it's transposing to other people on the team. And is it ever going to be good enough? And so like just today, I was like, okay, well, what are the key things that are going to make it really, really good? Uh, mm-hmm. And if it's really, really good, it's probably going to be great. And so it's limiting not limiting, but it's maybe doing a reset button and going, okay, like you said, do the best that I can. Am I doing the best that I can? But that's where that change and chaos maybe comes from. It's like, we're trying to one up. We're trying to be more innovative. We're trying to bring more to it. We're trying to make it amazing for people. And so with that comes a lot of change. And then it's like, how does that come back to the team? It's like, whoa, um, we're moving really fast. Exactly. It can be, it can be, it can be, uh, it can be chaotic for people. Absolutely right. And I think you 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 mentioned that beautifully. Um, there are a couple of other things you brought up, which I think are quite relevant. So part of it is our hard wiring. So we come into the world with different tolerance levels, and you know how much do we like change or not. So that's one one piece that I think is a, a fascinating piece with that, and everybody's different. So when it comes to leading people through change, 
you know, you're going to have the change itself and some normal human reactions, but then you're going to have people who, depending on their relationship to that change, their personality styles, it's going to be different. And so having that awareness. One of the concepts that I love, I'm a bit of a neuroscience geek, so I put some stuff in the webinar, I'm sorry, in the book about that is that um, people are, our brains are kind of a paradox when it comes to change. So you mentioned that on the one hand, we're agile and our brains are made for change. So we have this uh, ability called neuroplasticity, which is if a part of the brain becomes injured or, you know, that we used to think our brains were fully baked by a certain age and now we know, no, actually we can change and evolve, which is great. So on the one hand, that's fabulous. On the other hand, we are creatures of habit. And so the brain is designed for efficiency. So if we're doing something and it worked really well in the past, there's why are we changing? So that's the challenge oftentimes is finding that balance. One of the concepts I talk about that's important for leaders to understand is this concept of the analytic network in our brain versus the empathetic network. And when I learned about this, it really explained a lot to me. The analytic network is a series of functions in our brain that does a kind of what the title is. It's the problem solvers, right? So as you said, trying to make things better, always looking for ways to improve. We know leaders and businesses are involved. We're doing that to fix problems, to make things better. And that also is where we, we analyze data. We stick to timelines, project plans. All of that is in the analytic network. And then we have the empathetic network. And that is responsible for being able to see patterns or trends. Um, actually, that is where innovation comes from. And also the ability to pick up on or recognize the emotional cues, verbal and nonverbal, from people. And so usually somebody, we have preferences for one or the other. The kicker is that we, when we are operating in one, it suppresses the other. And most organizations reward and recognize the analytic network type of behavior. So being a good change leader, and I'd say a leader in general, means being able to toggle between those two and being aware enough, again, like what you were describing, what is it that's needed from me? What does my team need from me right now? Being able to read the cues of there's a problem and discomfort and, and maybe, okay, let me just slow down for a minute to understand so that then we can speed up. Um, and, and I think that's, that is was fascinating to me, which also is why somebody may be a change project manager, which they're managing timelines. So it's really almost impossible when they're in that mode to think about the human side the people aspects of change. And that's a lot of the difficulty that organizations and leaders have when they lead through change. The other is that you mentioned, which is great. You know that you want the next summit to be even better than the last one. So you've already made the decision yourself to change. But there are other people you're working with who maybe haven't had access to that information. They're not coming from the same perspective, they think about it differently. And so they need to decide to go along with you. And many leaders, especially higher up in organizations, when they make the decision to change, of course, there would be good reasons. They might have chosen the best option of the multiple options that exist. But that's just it. They've had access to the information. They've had time to digest it. And then they had control over the decision. And then they forget that their people who are hearing about something for the first time haven't had that access. So, so much of it is really, again, thinking about what do my people need to be successful? But then you have to take a pause for a minute, switch into that mode, and so that you can actually be more successful in trying to move the change forward versus skipping over all that messy stuff. Makes so much sense. And, you know, it's 
So just thinking about it here as you're as you're speaking, like number one, I mean, this is a uh, this podcast is an opportunity for me to even be reflecting on my own leadership style and some of the things that we're doing that's working and not working. I mean, a lot of people don't have that opportunity. Don't take the pause. I mean, our listener right now is is maybe doing a pause and thinking about it through our own story here, but. You know, it's so there's so many factors to it. There's so many different characteristics and, and behaviors. And we work in a virtual scenario. We have team members all over the world, Spain, Australia, th- throughout North America. None of us are in the same office or in the same location. Mm. And that, what I'm just listening is like, for there's so many cues that get lost and now, especially with like Slack, there's like huddles. I don't even need to have video anymore. I can, you know, remotely work with people on the phone, if you will. There's the Zoom, which comes with its own, you know, uh, distractions and whatnot. It's not the same as being in a room with somebody to understand how it's impacting them. Mm-hmm. Like, here's the change. And and what's the, like, okay, the meeting's ended now. How, what's the fallout, right? Not mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times. And so the way people communicate likely is changing a little bit because they may need to try and get all of their objections or thoughts or feedback in there. And that can seem really challenging as it's like, well, it's a lot of information, but then to give that feedback back or give back more information, it's, it's like, do we have more meetings? That's not an answer or it wasn't an answer. Traditionally, it was like, you know, we should be having less meetings, not more meetings. But when we're virtual, we're not in the same office. We don't get to have water cooler talk. We don't get to know some of the human side of things with people. And that limits, there's a lot of limiting stuff happening, which the the consequence is we don't get the most out of everybody. Like Just like why I left the corporate world, it's like if they knew more about what I liked and what I was looking for, and they would be able to capitalize on my strengths more effectively. Mm-hmm. So in small business, it's critical that we capitalize on people's strength. Otherwise, we're like, we're really missing out on our, on the real opportunity as a small business. So it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors here that are coming to my mind. I don't know that I have any answers for my own situation, but it certainly means, I think, listening. For me, it's like listening in meetings more than being in the to-do, like the project manager, time manager, mm-hmm. that you're saying is like, okay, got to turn off the project manager in the meetings and maybe spend a little bit more time just listening and w- how are people responding to these things? How are, how are they, you know, w- how are they taking them? Are they understanding it? Are we giving enough information? What, what contribution do they want to make? Because it's all like that book that was written years ago, Good to Great. It's like yes. the, 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 the thing I think everybody remembers was like, get people on the bus. I want to be on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> going where the bus is going. And that's like the, you know, one of the big takeaways is do you have the people that want to be on your bus and are, are good for your bus and all that good stuff? I was like, uh, in a virtual world that we're living in right now, it's hard to even know where the bus is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get on my oh cloud, my sit on my cloud, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's no seats. Uh, you just sort of hover. <laughs> Yes. I mean, again, such so much rich, juicy nuggets in there. So I mean, I'm trying to pick up on a few. So one of the I think, at least in talking to my my clients and you know my friends who are leaders, it's been a very interesting last couple of years. Where as a leader, if you didn't understand empathy or compassion, boy, you probably really got got a you know fire hose training on what people need. So I think there was some real positive leadership development that came out of the last couple of years about, you know, this things about what we've talked about boundaries in terms of separating the person from home and from work. And this is the, this is the, you know, home side and this is the professional side kind of fell away. So at the same time, I do think leaders had to show up with more listening, as you said, and and compassion. And at the same time, I think that was very exhausting for a lot of people who are still learning how do I develop that muscle. So in the book, much of what I talk about is 
listen, your job as a change leader is not to make people change. That's impossible. Like, you know, years of therapy at, at certain times, I think I've, I've, I've finally gotten better on that. I still slip into subtly or not so subtly trying to influence somebody's behavior. But oftentimes it's taking a moment and remembering, well, what's, what's my agenda here? So just having that awareness, which is wonderful, it sounds like you do, and I think more people have developed that. In the virtual world, yes, at times it can be harder because working from home for many people didn't just become working from home. It became working all the time. So people trying to reorient about what what are my boundaries? What's healthy? How do I take care of myself? Because the default is organizations will, it'll never be enough. And so I hear so many of my clients talk about the organizational motto that's become normal these days, which is do more with less, which when you think about it, it's insanity. Like it, it, it doesn't work. So many people are set up to fail. And it's not that the organization is not some sinister thing. It's just do, doing what organizations do, trying to drive greater efficiency, trying to always reduce those margins, increase profits. There's something inherently broken in how organizations have traditionally measured success. And I think some of those things are changing now. But it's when the person can begin, first of all, to understand when they're feeling overwhelmed or pressure, because also, as you said, it's hard to tell. There's never just one change. And so a lot of this comes from, okay, first of all, let me start with myself. Where am I at? If I'm feeling pressure, another change has come down. And I probably, it's, an, it's, it's probably exactly how my team is feeling. So even if I begin to build in as part of a normal conversation, let's talk about something that we're proud of. So what's an accomplishment that we have? This gets into that third principle I mentioned where celebrating, you know, gets you more success, especially in times of change. It's a resilience building. So many leaders have a hard time just pausing and catching people doing things that are right and really spending time there. But that is a resilience building tool. It's also something that sometimes people need some time to develop that ability to, to, to take in good stuff. Dr. Rick Hansen talks about it, and I think it's very well known. He says our brains are like uh, Velcro for bad news and Teflon for the good stuff. And so because we are psychologically three times more likely to give weight to the negative, it's really incumbent upon leaders this day, these days to to pause and scan for the good and remind their team of when we've been overwhelmed in the past. What are the strengths we have? What's helped us in the past? How do we use those as we go forward? How do we support each other? And a lot of this becomes the practice of shared leadership. So most leaders make the mistake, especially newer leaders, like I've got to have all the answers. I've got to have it figured out. And no, leadership is something you do with people not two people. And that's the same thing with change. Don't work so hard. This is your team's time. Let's talk about what it is that that would be most useful for them. And sometimes it's 10 minutes at the beginning um, just to say, hey, let's talk about what we're proud of, what's working. Let's talk about if we have some concerns. A couple of powerful questions I tell leaders, if a new change comes down, and as we all know, we've been on the other end of those emails that announce a change and then somehow something magical is supposed to happen and people are just supposed to automatically get it. doesn't work that way. Three simple questions you can ask your team is, as you think about this change, what excites you? What concerns you? Uh, Another couple, what might be gained? What might be lost? Right, the, the, Those are essentially two questions, but when you ask it that way and you give somebody permission and it comes from the team, oftentimes very quickly, if the team members hear it from each other and you make it okay to share concerns or obstacles, 
it becomes something that that the team can work on together. You involve them. You know, people don't get labeled as change resistors, right? So as a leader, your goal in these moments is is not to have all the answers. Your goal may be, hey, how do I surface as many questions as I can that I can't answer? That's winning. That's mm. success, right? So sometimes that shift can help as you said, when things are so busy and chaotic and we don't have the people, those water cooler conversations, building some of these habits into our daily meetings, it takes like 10, 15 minutes. You encourage people and then you you work together. Um, and that that's a, a way to involve people that can give them a little more control. That can be very helpful. I can see that. And I I like the questions because I I would imagine that I've made this mistake and and I know many others do as well. It's like, here's the change. Do you have any questions? Which is a closed answer opportunity. It's like, yes or no. I have questions. I don't have questions versus how's this, how's this change going to fail? You know, Uh right. That's a question that people can think about. It's open-ended and uh, not will this fail, but how will it fail or how will it be successful? Like that's often, it's just, again, the question of do you have any question is, questions is more like the project manager. It's like, here's what's happening. Any questions? Good, go. <laughs> Versus really opening up and asking more questions, listening more and, and have those questions be just more powerful, really. Uh, yeah. Some really, really c- cool thoughts, I think, for our listeners, number one, and you can reflect on this as well for them, which is the small business owner starts as a, as a solo, typically, mm-hmm. right? They, they go, and then in this industry, it goes from, I'm a technician, I'm working, I'm doing the work, maybe I'm working for somebody else. Now I'm going to start my own business. And it's just them. And as us having experienced that, it's like, I'm doing the work, I'm responsible I don't have to share the change or, you know, it's like, if I don't like the change, too bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's only me, right? Right, right? So evolving to team is where, you know, one or two, maybe there, there's not as big an impact. But as it grows, as there's more team members, it's no longer about doing the work. It's about actually being a leader. And and that's that's, I think, it can be a challenging transition that if not thought about or observed, can get into some 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 difficult situations or, or or limit the growth or limit the success that one can have in their organization from a small small business standpoint without doing some of this thinking and pivoting and changing. Like we're not going to be like for myself. I know that who I was when I started the business to where I am today and where I need to go. I'll have to evolve. If I don't, mm-hmm. the business won't evolve because I am you now it's part of the, the, the I have to evolve because what's going to be needed in the future is, isn't going to necessarily be the, you know, the strengths or characteristics that I have to. So I have to evolve and that's part of the excitement, I guess. And the other piece I wanted to say was this in a business and with the change and especially in the bookkeeping and accounting industry, a lot of change we're helping clients make mm-hmm. and and literally some of them not wanting to change or maybe don't know why they should change, but it's not necessarily their employees. But I think a lot of this is very powerful and, and will be impactful from a revenue perspective and a customer satisfaction perspective, which is how to help their clients embrace the change and and go along with some of the change that maybe they're recommending that they make in in their businesses around the way that they're doing things. Yes. Yes. And you, I mean, again, you mentioned a couple of really great points there. So I'll just pick up on the last piece, which is helping other people through change. You mentioned a, a, a key word there, which is why. So oftentimes when organizations or we talk about change, we focus on, okay, what what the change is, maybe the technical aspects, which is great, and then the benefits that we're trying to get from the change. That's important, but there, if you think about the person when a change is coming down 
and you didn't decide uh, to make the change, you're, the change is coming down, you know, what, what's the first question you want to know? What's the, what do you think the first question you have might be? That's a good question. <laughs> I would say it's going to be cross between how does it impact me? Mm-hmm. And then why was, why was the, why was the change made? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I would probably See, the, first, the first one was that, expert. you know, I think that's <laughs> it. It's that it really is. It's like, why, why is this change being made? Like, as I, I want to understand uh, yes. the perspective, right. Which is so interesting that when people ask me that it's like on the, on the opposite side, it can be um, such a, such a blind spot, really. Yes. That, and that is it because you've already made the decision to change. You're doing your job right? This is going to be better for the company. Why won't those pesky employees just do what we tell them to do, right? But you just said it beautifully. As on the receiving end of a change that impacts you, the first thing you want to know is what does this mean for me? And that's oftentimes what gets missing as well as why. Now, the why we understand is actually really important. So there's another concept I talk about in the book. I I try to keep it really simple. I talk about five kind of brain concepts, which fuel the work and and then the actions that I, and advice that I give to people. It's this thing called switch costs. So the inside our brain is this unconscious kind of tiny accountant, really, who's always calculating the cost benefit analysis. So if a change comes down, it's always saying, well, is making the effort going to be worth it? So meantime, if I make an effort, you're asking me to learn something new, which may mean that I'm losing being the expert um, at something I was doing. So you're asking me to give that up. You're also in an environment where maybe I don't feel safe taking risks right? Making mistakes isn't okay. So you've got two dings now against you about my willingness because the switch cost. It's not worth my effort to actually make the change. So when you are leading through change, it's very important to, first of all, as we said, if you view somebody's reaction or resistance as normal, that's okay. Just concerns to be uncovered. That's number one. And you, of course, they want to know what does this mean for me? So, so you have conversation, you provide them with information, including here's what we don't know yet, right? Because our brains hate uncertainty more than anything, right? So, but we're doing the best to normalize uncertainty. Yes, that's fine. And then we learn more. We give people an opportunity to ask questions, but part of it is why sharing not only the what's change, but why we need to make the change, potentially making more visible because people might not have that perspective. Here are the headwinds. Uh, Here's what's happening in the market, or here's what happens if we don't make the change. So why, how does this come down and impact them? You still are going to have people who might be like, ugh, you know, I really liked what I was doing. That's okay. Of course, that's normal. Um, But at some point, if you give them more information, especially if they are responsible for, for doing the new behaviors, and you actually reward people. So to help them overcome switch costs, it's rewarding people for trying something new and for learning versus doing something perfectly. And this is where the celebration comes in. So, hey, we tried something. It didn't go so well. Okay, well, what did we learn? And so I really appreciate you trying this. We thought it would go well. And that's oftentimes what happens with change. You got it on a piece of paper, but then when rubber meets the roads, right, more more things change. And that's okay. So while involving your people, and this touches on the topic that you mentioned, getting work done through others. What's so hard for leaders is oftentimes is not, is helping clarify the what people have to do as opposed to telling them how to do it. Mm. And that is the differentiation when you start to get more work done through others is really knowing when you need to ask and coach versus tell somebody. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was a lot there. <laughs> so <laughs> many things. <laughs> well, there's so many things and it's been a fantastic conversation on it and and really I, I think a great episode to 
for our listener to to reflect on their own situation and where where is it most where is the the most impact going to be made? Is it is it with your team? And if you're solo right now, uh, thinking about your customers or where wherever there is leadership required, because if we're we're either leading in our business with our team or we're leading clients, uh, you know, it's it's all applicable. And some great great nuggets in this conversation mm-hmm. around how to do it, how to do it better, what to think about. Uh, so super valuable. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about, you have shared about the book, but I'd love for you to tell, like, get, you know, the book is coming out in, yeah. in, in the new year, uh, in February. Um, it's already, we can hear that there's some great content going to be coming out that's going to help anyone that is involved in leading teams or, or leading people through change. Anything else to share about the book? Yeah, I think the a couple of things. One is that I wrote this book specifically to be quite practical. So it is an, I, I mean, I consider it a, a fairly easy read. There's so many business books that I loved, but I was always like, what can I do with this? So I make it very easy uh, with here's some fundamental concepts, but now here's how you do it, how you engage and actually make it happen. So I have conversation guides. So you're going to have a tough conversation. Here's your situation. Here's resistance. I actually give people sample words of things to say to help guide them through. Because most of the time what I hear is, yeah, yeah, Elizabeth, we get the change leadership matters. Just tell us what to do. So I try to make it very easy for people having been in their shoes, like I am the reader or the client of this book, so that people can implement it right away. I also try to use stories and make it humorous um, so that that's helpful. I also have samples of, okay, uh, you want to have a team conversation about a new change. Here's how you facilitate that. There's also two particular chapters that are great for certain changes that are happening now. One is if you've got changes that involve job loss. So there's, you know, how do you handle that tough question of, am I going to lose my job? There's guidance there. And then another one, listen, maybe a huge hurt about a change the same time that your people did. And that could be because the communication wasn't great or nobody knew about it. It came out of left field. And some, and some guidance for working through that, as well as how do you measure progress and how do you help build resilience in your team? And a lot of it is, as you mentioned, you know, strengths, helping people celebrate what's working and, and use more of their strengths. Sounds like a fantastic book. Super excited to get it for myself. And I know it'll be very valuable for our listeners. In the meantime, book's coming out in February 2023. In the meantime, what's the best way for people to learn more about you and the work that you're doing, Elizabeth? Well, sure. Well, anybody can feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn for sure. Mention this podcast, Orient Me. That would be great. I love that. Also, feel free to visit my website, uh, elizabethmorantransformation.com. There will be more for the individual leader. I'll be putting you know, articles there and things, quick tips if people want to learn more. So that's, that would be a great place to do that. Wonderful. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you. And, and on behalf of our listener, I want to thank you for your generosity and coming on the show and sharing your expertise and your journey with us. Uh, such an honor and a pleasure, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast to learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to successfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.